Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Greg Griffin, Pastor Greg Griffin. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be at in the world. Uh, my name is Greg, and um, I'm an addict. Um, just want to let everybody know this is about the third week. I am going to be coming at you guys live um, every Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and, and I hope to give uh, little talks about different uh, facets of recovery. Um, last week, I shared a little bit about relapse prevention, um, a little bit about the emotional and the physical cues that can leave us feeling vulnerable or um, at a risk of relapse. Um, so, so tonight, what I would like to do, guys, is um, I would like to share some coping strategies with you um, where I can go over some ideas, some thoughts, some proven methods um, of things that you can use um, maybe go-to moves, if you will, or, or a tool in your tool belt, if you will, um, on how you can handle um, triggers as they come to get you out of that, um, get you out of that frame of mind. Um, okay, before doing so, folks, um, I would like to share uh, my story with you a little bit. Um, if you haven't heard my story, uh, back in mid-February on uh, The Magical Road to Recovery, my brother, um, David Griffin, and his lovely wife, um, Leslie, interviewed me. And I, I think it's a, um, it's an hour and 30 minutes, hour and 29 minutes. But it should be somewhere there on uh, my brother's um, Facebook page. You can find it. So anyways, my name is Greg, and I'm an addict, as I said. Um, I first started using drugs and alcohol. I guess you see, I, I first started using marijuana. So I wasn't even really considering myself using drugs and alcohol at the time I tried it. It was the um, summer between my junior year and my senior year in high school. And um, it just really, really um, put things off and running for me in my life. And, um, you know, the misery that my drug addiction um, took my family and friends and uh, people that care about me um, today in my life. Um, anyway, so I smoked some weed. Um, in the summer going into my senior year of high school, I was a, I was a, a track athlete and a wrestler. I started um, competing in sports at an early age as our middle brother, my, my brother David and my middle brother um, was maybe about almost two years older than me, one year and 10 months. And I wanted to beat his butt in anything I possibly could. So it really set the tone for me at an early age as far as training and the different sports. Actually, I followed in the sports that my brother did, um, wrestling and running. And anyway, so what happened with, I was having a conversation with my brother um, and David and I was talking to him and he was, was asking me some questions. And um, he asked me kind of what set that ball off um, as far as, you know, the comparison or the, um, the thinking that the adrenaline or that euphoric feeling um, that I would get when I would run a personal best time or I would win a wrestling tournament and I was on the top step there and having the medal and the little olive branch have, have you put on my head. Um, once I finished high school, that stuff was off the table for me. And so I think drugs started filling that void for myself. So um, it started with marijuana. Um, after high school, then I started dabbling in, in other stuff. I mean, you're around some some people that, you know, you know, have marijuana and pills and stuff like that. You open the door to a whole different subset of friends and um, to just new environments. So I started with doing a little bit of uh, speed. I did a little bit of math. I started a little bit of coke. Um, really, really liked it a lot. I liked the way that it made me feel um, too much, obviously, as, as, as the story goes on. Um, and along with my drug use, there, there started becoming um, legal issues. So it started out, you know, you get in trouble, you get put on probation for a year, um, then got into a little bit more trouble and six months in the county jail and a year in the county jail. Um, so anyways, the ante started going up as I got older and I started using more and more. Um, I ended up going to Nevada in uh, 1984, the state of Nevada, and I ended up um, over a weekend writing a series of checks that weren't my checkbook. It wasn't my checkbook. They weren't my checks, but I wrote a series of checks over a drunken two-day weekend. There are eight checks to be exact. And um, what ended up happening, what I did was I, I was a clever addict, or so I thought. Um, I wrote a check because I couldn't cash me the cashier's cage. Um, 
we'd already kind of burned that thing out. So the genius that I am, I wrote a check to check into a suite at Caesars Palace for four nights, wrote the check, $200 a night, $800 for four nights. That evening, I'd go down at three in the morning. I have an emergency in my family. Hopefully, I'm not like cluing people on how to be a better criminal. That's not, that is not my intent. Um, so we check out and I get the $600 cash back. So anyways, as it had, had it, of course, you know, I was drinking, gambling. And before I know it, the gig was up. Security surrounded me, arrested me. Um, I went to Minden County Jail right outside of Lake Tahoe. And um, I did not know the seriousness or how much trouble I was in at the time. So anyways, once all the smoke cleared and I had these eight checks, I met with, uh, you know, the public defender and all that. And I had an arraignment of my court court date and stuff. And the public defender said, well, Greg, he says, they're offering to see if you'll plead guilty to one check. The thing was, is in the state of Nevada, each check that I wrote over that weekend, each check carried one to 10 years in the state penitentiary in Nevada. I pleaded guilty to one check and they ended up getting five years in the penitentiary. And that is really kind of the beginning of my criminal life there. You go in, in today's world, um, we, I work right now, I'm, I work in the drug and alcohol field I have for the last 21 years. Um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit in a minute. Um, but, you know, as, as time goes on and, um, you know, you start, you go to prison and you start, you know, hanging out with different people, you learn you, you know, as far as our justice system goes, in my opinion, there are just so much, much money being said. You know, prisons are big business. Prisons are in business and they're big business. They make more money having you locked up there than the county would be spending or the state would be spending on you to go to drug treatment program, which is what should really actually be ha happening. So anyways, um, I did that prison time, came back to California. I went into a drug program, stayed there six months. My brother David helped me get in from prison. Stayed there six months. I thought that I had a grip on things, but I didn't. So anyways, I got out of the program. Um, I had to go back and report to Nevada um, from the parole that I had. And when I went up there, um, never reported and things just really got, um, things just really got off and running. Um, living in Las Vegas, I loved it. I love the action. I like the excitement. Um, I'm, as you, you know, I'm a, like I said earlier, I'm an adrenaline guy. And so everything, it was just perfect for me. So after a year and a half in, um, up in Nevada, um, a friend of mine who was a heroin addict, um, didn't really know much too much about heroin or heroin addicts at the time, um, was introduced to heroin. And um, when I tried it for the first time, eh, I could take it or leave it. It made me itchy. I remember it made me really itchy. And, um, and I threw up a lot too. And for some reason, I guess I liked the high or the feeling that the itchiness and um, the throwing up didn't bother me so much. Um, anyways, I dabbled with that for a couple of months. And then before I know it, I was hanging out with my buddy that was the heroin addict and was with him for a period of about a week. And it didn't take me but a week um, before I got a heroin habit, um, which was the beginning of really my downward spiral um, in my life. Um, while I was addicted to heroin, um, being a heroin addict is hard, hard work. Um, where I work at today in a um, substance abuse program um, that I've worked in for 21 years, um, I have clients that come in and, you know, there's, you know, heroin is still, heroin is still a pretty popular oxycontins. We call them oxys or roxycodones. Um, heroin um, are still a really, really rampant drug of choice around here. And the sad thing about it is, is I don't know if folks are aware or not, or have been following um, what's been going on with opiates and heroin in the world. Um, but now they are actually, um, taking the heroin and they're cutting it with bits of fentanyl um, in it to make it stronger, you know, to make it stronger, to get people hooked. And what's happening is a lot of folks are overdosing and, and dying behind it. Um, you know, I was before I, I looked into this, when I heard about the fentanyl, I was thinking, well, doesn't the fentanyl cost more or, or you know, than heroin does. So come to find out, I, I, I looked into it a little bit and, and what happened is, is the cartels down in Mexico, um, one of the head of the cartels hired this um, chemist to train um, a couple of cartel buddies that, you know, that, that, that was into a little bit of that kind of stuff, um, how to cook up and make fentanyl. 
So they train these guys how to cook up and make fentanyl. And so what they were doing was that's how they had access to the fentanyl that they started cutting the heroin with. So anyways, um, anyways, that's what's going on now. But anyways, I was talking about being a heroin addict. It's, it's, it's hard work. Um, let me explain what I, what I mean by that um, in, in my story. Um, I was addicted to heroin from 1991 up to my birthday, which is March 7th, 1997, is the day I went and was hospitalized at the end of my heroin use. But from 1991 to 1997, um, I went to county jail for 30 days once, and then I got busted for some paraphernalia in Las Vegas, went to jail for 14 days. Um, so between that 30 and 14 days, first, it was really crazy because I had to kick. I had to, you know, I was dope set kick. Um, I had to kick in um, um, county jail. It takes three or four days. You're really sick to your stomach, crawled in the fetal position, just, you know, thrown up, diarrhea, just, you know, it just it's not a good thing. So anyways, after I be in, was in county jail for 30 days, first thing I would do is i go look up the dope man. i cop heroin and boom, I'd be off and running again. So before the, uh, with the exception of the 30 days and the 14 days, it's a total of 44 days in my, in my life, in my heroin addiction, um, six years minus 44 days, I shot dope every single day, several times a day. Um, being a heroin addict, I would never go to bed at night unless I had, my, I call it my wake up. What it really was, I also call it getting well. Because when you'd wake up in the morning after sleeping in the night, you wake up dope sick. And the only thing that's going to get you better is, is some heroin. And so anyways, um, besides those 44 days, I shot dope um, every day, several times a day. Um, didn't take care of any health, obviously. Um, I'm talking a minute about my hospitalization and, and what my health was like and um, what it was like for me um, in my life back then. Um, anyway, so I tell I tell the opiate um, addicts and heroin add, um, heroin addicts that um, are, are currently in the program that I work in, I would tell them, um, you know, if you could put in half of the amount of energy and 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 focus on your um, recovery right now, fifty percent, you're going to make it. You go a long ways because being a heroin addict, it was just, as I said, several every day, several times a day. So it was really, really hard. You really, really had to work hard to be in a junkie. As funny as that might sound. Um, so anyways, I went into the hospital in 1997. Just, just, just I want to give you guys a little bit of a backstory tonight. Told my story a couple months ago. I, I told you, I already directed you to where it could go. But I was just talking to my brother earlier. And, um, you know, you, you, this might be your very, very first time meeting me. My very first time meeting you. Hope this is, becomes a relationship to where um, you can tune in every Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific time. And hopefully I can give you a, give you a little bit of um, hope. You know, I told my they, my brother David and his lovely wife, Wes, uh, Leslie, last Thanksgiving, um, they were over, over our house. My, my mom passed away almost a year ago, a couple more days, it'll be a year ago. And um, they were talking about, you know, about the, the church and about, you know, there, there's people out there that, that do need some help, you know, and need some hope as far as, you know, getting clean and sober and, and all that. And, and, you know, when they asked me to do, do it, it just really, really got my juices flowing. You know, my brother was telling me, you know, Greg, we, we, we have we have clients, we have people that are members in our church and stuff from all around the world, you know. And I just thought it was a really, really cool thing. And so that's that's why I'm here talking to you right now, sharing my story with you. So anyways, I went into the hospital. Um, I, I remember I had really bad pain in my chest. I thought it was my heart. Um, didn't go to the hospital for several days because I didn't want to go there and be dope sick. Um, you know, not really realizing at the time with the medical condition I had, they were going to stabilize me. Um, and they put me on methadone is what, what I was on when I was hospitalized. Anyways, and I was in the hospital for two months my left lung was full of fluid and during just the antibiotics and stuff they gave me in the hospital didn't totally get rid of it so they had to go in and they had to do surgery on me they went in they drained my lung they had to go in i, I remember i was reading the medical paperwork um a few months back you know i saw all the medical paperwork that i had and and it was describing the surgery we had to go in and there was a fiber fibrous peel um, on the inner lining of my lung that had trapped on the inside of my lung a cottage cheesy like substance. I mean, isn't that enough to make you sick? So anyways, I went through that. Um, 
surgery and thank God, um, you know, I have a family that loves me, you know, mom and dad um, that loved me and cared about me, you know, to, you know, that made the transition from when I was hospitalized to being able to have a bridge to where I could go back home here to California and get better. And so anyways, that's what I ended up doing is I ended up flying home. They had to wait a couple of days to fly me home after my surgery because, um, because of the surgery that I had in my lungs and the pressure, pressurized, um, you know, thing about in an airplane that, you know, there's a certain amount of pressure and there's certain conditions that you can't fly under. And so anyways, went to the hospital, left the hospital. Um, my mom and dad had paid for a plane ticket for me to fly from um, the hospital in Las Vegas to, to the airport in Oakland. And so they, they bought me around, not a round trip, one way ticket. I didn't know that my brother was going to be there waiting for me at the airport, but he was, when I got there, my brother was there and um, he, they, they wheeled me in, in a wheelchair and um, got on the plane and I flew home. Um, when I got home and I was released from the hospital guys, I weighed 124 pounds Um you know, that's it was, you know, lucky to be alive then, you know, and I thank God. And I thank my family and thank my, my parents for, you know, giving me another chance to um, to be able to, you know, get my life together. Anyways, once I got home, um, my mom strategically placed this um, flyer that came in the mail, maybe a couple of months after I got home and said celebrate recovery on it. So she sat on the table there and sat for, you know, a month and a half, two months. And then now, now, now it's September. This is November 4th. I still remember vividly the date of it. And so towards the end of October, I told my mom, I said, you know, mom, I said, I see that. I see that. Um, see that flyer there. You know, I would like to go, you know, check that out. You know, I just needed something outside of myself, you know, something I could find hope in, something that I can, you could find peace in, you know. Um, here I was, this, you know, 37-year-old, you know, unemployed, 124 pounds, trying to get my strength and my weight back and to get healthy again. Um, and all this time that I'm back home, I'm thinking I'm coming back home to get my strength back, get back on my feet so I can go back up to Las Vegas again and hang out, start shooting dope again. Can you imagine that? 124 pounds. So anyways, um, thank God that, you know, um, my mom put that there and that, um, she came with me originally to go to, um, celebrate recovery. And, um, you know, it was a wonderful thing. You know, when mom came for the first time with me, she was going to support me in getting my help. And, um, little did she know she was going to get her own help too. They had, they had groups that obviously I was in the chemical dependency group. They had a sex addiction group. They had a codependency group, which my mom was the codependency group. And so anyways, um, we did that. And so, I started getting better. I started building a faith, my faith in God and started finding a purpose in life. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was a wonder, it was a good decision to do that. Um, and as I got better and as my mom, you know, she, she started making friends at the church and, you know, I met a lot of friends at the church and, and you know, it's a really, really, um, it was a really, really positive thing in a minute when I share, uh, tonight, guys, when I share a little bit about, you know, relapse prevention and coping strategies and stuff. Um, I'm going to go into some coping strategies. And there's a lot of talk like call a friend or call your sponsor, sponsors in 12 step meetings. I'm going to go into a little more detail of that when I talk about 12 step meetings, I talk about 12 step involvement and fellowship. I'll touch on that because early on, whenever I started going to this re uh, celebrate recovery, I remember really very, very well, the, the gentleman that ran celebrate recovery, he was a celebrate recovery pastor. And, um, his name was John Nielsen, and um, he just he, he took me under his wing. You know, he saw he, he heard my story. You know, he saw me during my transition. You know, I was far from, you know, well, when I started going. I mean, heck, I'd only been home five months when I started going. And so anyways, um, thank God that he put him in my life. And he told me early on, he shared with me, he says, you know what, Grace? He says, you need to, he says, it's really not that difficult, Greg. He says, you, you, you need to change playgrounds and playmates. And, you know, that really resonated with me. You know, I, I need to change playgrounds and playmates. You know, um, it made sense. No more hanging out, guys, with the old friend. To you. It's going to pull you down, right? Any of the old friends that you have in your phone still, 
you know, you need to delete them, get rid of them. You know, they're not going to do anything but bring you down. Um, so anyways, you know, it was a great message for me. And um, so after I was home, um, you know, a year and a half, two years, you know, and I wasn't going to go back to Las Vegas and start shooting dope again, go figure that. Right. Um, I had to decide what I wanted to do with my life, you know, what I wanted to do for a living. You know, I was only 38, 39 years old at this time. So thank God, once again, mom and dad, you know, um, helped me out, you know, paid my way to school so I can get a career. And in 2000, I was certified as a drug and alcohol counselor. I started an internship in 1999 at the program that I currently work in. I've now worked there for 21 years. So God's been good to me in those in that respect. Okay, guys. So um, that's a little bit about you know my story. Well, but before before I uh, before I uh, end my story for tonight, I just want to share because um, this has really, really, really been on my heart a lot lately. Um, um, in nine more days, um, in nine more days, my mom, who I've just talked to you about going to celebrate recovery with, and 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 you know, we shared a lot, a lot. Um, through that program and you know it opened her eyes you know to codependency and stuff and it really opened my eyes too you, you, you know to just to a lot of things you know and um yeah nine days she died may 29th um of last year um and now my dad my my father he's um we didn't know if he would make it a year and here nine more days it'll be a year that he's made it my mom and dad celebrated my mom and dad's um wedding anniversary um is may 10th and um before my mom died, uh, 19 days before my mom died last year, my mom and dad, she was in the hospital, but my dad was there. They got to celebrate their 65th wedding anniversary then, you know, with each other. So that was, so that was nice. Um, but anyways, my mom was really sick and um, her, her um, one year anniversary of passing away is coming up. And, um, you know, I just really, really remember my mom's, um, my mom's last month. Um, on earth here. Um, she got rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. Um, this was probably three weeks, a couple weeks, before, maybe three weeks before she passed, early May. Um, she was, we had, a, me and my sister had to call an ambulance and they came and picked her up at home and um, brought her to the hospital. And while she was in the ambulance, she had a heart attack. And um, when she was being wheeled into emergency, my sister was in the um, ambulance with my mom. And um, she was, she had two more heart attacks. And the doctor told my sister at that point in time, he said, if there's family or friends, you need to notify him now because, you know, mom was, was on her way out. Come to find out my mom was, a, was a battler. She battled through a lot of stuff her last year in life. Um, but, um, anyway, she came back through and came back to, um, about, um, two days after, after these heart attacks. And I got to tell mom then at that point in time, I Said, you know, mom, I said, I got to really experience what it felt like to lose you because we thought that we had lost you. And I told her, I said, from this day forward, mom, you are now my bonus mom. <laughs> and so that what that meant to me was I got to love on her. I got to love on her heart. Um, I remember her last, you know, since that happened th two or three weeks before she died, my mom loved massage. And, you know, I, I'm not a massage therapist by trade or anything, but I, I, I give a pretty mean massage. I would, you could ask my sister that she would say yes. Um, but I was at the hospital every night and I'd give my mom a shoulder and neck massage and upper back massage, you know? Um, and I, one night I missed my little girl, my not so little girl anymore, Lindsay. She um, graduated, uh, I don't know, maybe a week or two for, before my mom passed. And so I didn't end up going to the hospital that night. And my sister was sure to remind me that next morning, mom was wondering where you're at because she wanted a massage. And so um, that, it was touching. Anyways, guys, that's my little bit of my story. Um, okay, so now I want to go into, let me see here. Now I want to go into um, relapse prevention. We're talking about relapse prevention. Last week, I shared some triggers and stuff with you about what um, a trigger is and coping strategies. Let me give you, a first of all, let me give you a definition of, uh, a couple definitions of a relapse. A relapse is the act or instance of backsliding, worsening, or subsiding, or a reoccurrence of sim symptoms of a disease after a period of improvement. 
So basically, guys, um, it's like cancer, you know, um, drug and alcohol use we, we have found through time and studies and stuff is a brain disease. So it's not unlike asthma. It's not unlike cancer. It's not unlike diabetes. It is a relapsable disease. So sometimes does everybody relapse? No. Matter of fact, statistically, between 50 and 60 people, 50, 60 percent um, of folks that get into recovery, decide they don't want to use drugs and alcohol anymore and steer, go down that path of not using it again. 50 to 60 people experience relapse. Just a little statistic for you. Okay, so of, of um, relapse triggers, there's both emotional and um, physical triggers. So for emotional, let me just use this word, this acronym for you. It's easy if any of you know anything about recovery or AA, you'll recognize it's called HALT, H-A-L-T. It stands for don't ever get too um, hungry, don't ever get too angry, don't ever get too lonely, and don't ever get too tired. Okay, so I'm going to take each of those, just quick brief thing about it. Don't get too hungry. So what does that mean? What that means is, is that when we're in our addiction, obviously, most of us, like 90% of us, I would venture to say, don't give a crap about our nutrition or about eating even. Go figure, right? How do you think I got down to 124 pounds? You know, there wasn't much eating going on here. I used to tell my friend that I was with, I would get up in the morning, I'd drink a 40, and then maybe I'd drink another 40 in the evening. And I say, well, it says on the bottle here, 40 ounces, 890 calories or something. And, you know, that's just how my sick mind was over, over that. So anyways, you know, we, we, what it's basically saying is we need to start paying attention to nutrition um, while we're in recovery. Don't ever get too angry. Now, this one right here, anger is probably the most um, biggest trigger and reason for relapse, you know, um, angry is just, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it, it, there could be healthy anger and then there could be inappropriate anger. And what that is, healthy anger is learning how to walk through it and work with, with that, you know, it, they come in various forms. You can either see a therapist, um, you know, when I want therapist life and be able to process some of that stuff. There is also what I do is I refer, there's a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of websites and stuff, practice deep breathing techniques, learning stress reduction, learn how to be able to self calm yourself when you're, when you're in a situation like that. Don't ever get too lonely. Um, loneliness is a really big thing in recovery. And let me tell you why. Um, in early recovery, basically, like I said, my, 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 my spiritual sponsor, John told me, Greg, you got to change playgrounds and playmates. You know, that really, really resonated with me. So what did that mean? All the using friends that I used to have that I used to use with and hang out with, you know, they're, 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 they're no more, at least they should be no more. So now you've broken off those relationships with those folks. So anyways, and then on the other side of that coin, you have your friends that you had before you started using drugs and alcohol. And you have family, too, that you had during the time you're using and not during the time that you're using. And so you think you're going to go back to your friends um, before your addiction, but only to come and find out that they're not ready to take you back right now. You know, just because I decided to get clean and sober doesn't mean the world is going to change and adapt you know, to my needs, you know, I hurt a lot of people in my addiction. I, 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 I really hurt my mom and my dad while I was in my addiction. And um, I just thank God right now that I, 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 I was able to make peace with my mom and love on my mom really hard um, before she passed. And if I haven't mentioned, my dad's on hospice right now. And, and um, me and my sister uh, both care for my dad. And, you know, I tell my supervisor at work, she always asks me, how's dad doing? And um, I just always, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just loving him up. I'm just going to love on my dad. I tell him, my dad was not a very emotional guy. Maybe anger was his emotion or or, or being through or tired with things. His, his mode of babysitting us when we were little kids, especially me, I remember very well, mom would leave, dad would be in there. As soon as I made a peep or do anything, do your room. And so I used to have to go to my room. That was my dad's you know, way of dealing with us. But anyways, he, he wasn't a really emotional guy. And so, you know, he's softening up a little bit now, but I make sure every night and sometimes I don't get a response from him. But every single night before he goes to bed, I like to call it tucking him in bed, even though I don't literally tuck my dad in bed. But I always say, I love you, dad. Is there anything I can do for you? I love you. And this, you know, then I told my supervisor and my sister too, me and my, like I said, me and my sister care for my dad, you know, and, you know, guys love on your parents. You know, love on your family. 
you know, we get this COVID-19 thing going around, you know, and it's not discriminating. You know, we don't know how long we're going to be around, folks. We just don't. So love on your friends. Okay, let me get back to um, relapse prevention. So I was on lonely. Now let me go to the very last one. Don't get too tired. Um, we no longer have any of the, I remember when I first got clean as an opiate addict, there were so many restless nights, so many nights that I got very, very little sleep. You know, you try to take hot baths. You try to, to you know, listen to music, soft music. Um, we can no longer take the chemical sleep aids that we used to take. No more drinking ourselves to to to, um, to sleep, you know, passing out. There's no more nodding myself to sleep with opiates. There's no more taking Xanax or Valium because um, those are off the table now that you're in, in, in recovery. But if I could suggest, guys, something, you know, we have melatonin, natural chemical, natural homeopathic um, medication. We have valerian. We have chamomile tea. So there's a lots of stuff, guys. You know, go in there and Google the sleep, you know, that you need to sleep. But can you take this natural? Google is your friend. Google is wonderful. So anyways, that's what I would suggest as far as that goes, um, you know, as far as a trigger of not being able to go to sleep, to be able to, you know, find some relief in that and just, you know, check it out. Now I want to go to some physical um some physical triggers that um, we experience. And you know what, guys? It's really crazy because I'm going to share a little bit as I'm going through these physical triggers, um, a little bit about my own personal experience um, and how, you know, maybe just a blurb here or there about um, what it was like for me, um, if it's helpful that way. So music, okay, certain kinds of music comes on the radio and, you know, and it reminds you of, you know, when you were drinking or using or reminds you of a, a relationship you were in that was unhealthy. You turn, you know, turn the radio off or turn the channel. Also, guys, there's the smells. I remember when I first came home, you know, just smells. Like, you know, you, you, you know, sometimes you'll go someplace and you'll, some, you'll smell baking something that reminds you of grandma's, grandma's baking when, she was, when you were a kid. So anyway, smells. I live in the uh, um, San Francisco Bay Area. And so we have a thing called Bar Bear Rapid Transit. And I go to Oakland. I'm a sports fan. So I go to Oakland A's games, Oakland Raiders games now, Las Vegas Raiders now, um, San Francisco Giants games. And we have a thing called Bar. And so whenever I, when I first got clean and came home and I started going to those games, anytime I would go into a bar bathroom, it would remind me of snoring cocaine because that's what I used to do when I was in my addiction. I used to go in there, lock the door. There's only one person in there at a time, only one door, only one lock. And the only way somebody could get in there is if it was a station agent that, you know, if you're in there for a half an hour, so you weren't going to get interrupted, but that, that smell of that bathroom made me go back and think about snorting cocaine again. Um, money. Money is a big one. Um, you know, when I got clean, the place that I work out right now, the, the substance abuse program that I work out right now, um, it used to be a little bit more longer term and people would go get jobs and work and they would turn their paychecks in, pay off some of the money they owed the program or paid their rent or whatever it was. And they were learned to be able to, they learned, they learned to be able to live on a budget, you know, of 60 or $70 a week. And they learned to do that. And they learned to be able to, you know, set money aside. But anyways, um, money is a really big one. Um, having a paycheck that's $900 in cash, and having have $900 um, cash in your pocket is a huge trigger guys. So what I did early on is I, you know, I relinquished my, my control of my paychecks over to my father. You know, maybe you have to do, do you maybe you have to relinquish it to your wife or your brother, whoever you have in your life that you trust with your money. OK, guys, some people say, oh, hell, I'm 50 years old and I work 40 hours and, you know, I just I shouldn't have to turn my money over to anybody. Right. Well, you know, you can go with that if you want and have that nine hundred dollars in your pocket and see how you make it through, through the weekend. So anyways, where I'm going with this is, is it's real. First of all, as far as recovery goes. And as an aspect of recovery and a trait that I would love to give somebody in recovery would be, 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 be the trait of being humble, okay? To be teachable, to, to you know, humility. Um, if you saw any of my talks, this, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less often. So yeah, you know, guys, sometimes, you know, suck it up and be humble. It's okay to be humble. People like humble. Some people like humble. Some people feed off of somebody that is humble. But um, being humble is a good place to be, guys, in, in early recovery. You know, obviously, you know, our way didn't work, guys. Our way didn't work. 
let's be open and try something different. Okay, then, um, how about this? Go into the grocery store, especially for us alcoholics out there, right? You know, Jesus Christ, when you go there and they have this section, it's usually off in the corner and they usually have the big things, um, big bottles of, you know, tequila and all the top shelf liquor they have is stacked up, right? So nowadays they have in the front of the um, liquor store in, in cases and stuff so people don't rip it off. But anyways, it's like, how do you think that feels to an alcoholic? You go, how do you think it would feel? Crack cocaine on aisle three, you know, methamphetamine, aisle five. You know, every time that an alcoholic goes to the grocery store, especially new in recovery, it can be a, it can be a, a tough thing. So what do they do? Um, you know, bring a friend, you know, bring somebody, bring a sponsor, bring a friend that's supportive of your recovery, you know, talk about those feelings after they come up and process those feelings after they come up. Okay. Um, exits on a freeway, exits on a freeway. So what does that mean? Okay. You're driving down the road. You're, you're driving down the road. Um, there's, there's an exit on a freeway that you're used to getting off on that the connection lives a few blocks away where you have to go cop. So anyways, you're driving down the freeway and this, this, um, this exit has this gravitational pull towards you to where, you know, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I, um, what do you do? One, you can take a different route home, even if it's five or 10 miles further, you could do that. If it's really, really a strong, um, urge, um, call a friend or call your sponsor five minutes before you get to that, um, freeway exit and, and talk your way through it. Um, one last physical trigger is, and this is really, really, this was really, really a trip because um, this is really, really a trip because I experienced this. And when I experienced it, I experienced almost three years into my, three years into my um, recovery. And God, I was surprised how strong of a, um, how strong of a pull it was on, on my heart and my mind. And um, in, in, in 1999, um, I told you, I just went to school and stuff and get certified for my drug and alcohol, you know, um, certification. And we had to go, I had to go up. It was a Saturday morning at 8 a.m. So what I did is I drove to Sacramento. It's about a two hour drive from where I live and got a motel room for the night. So I get a good night's sleep, wake up, be able to go get a jog in the morning, be clear headed to get my coffee, bam, go over to, to, to take my test. Checking into the motel room, guys, getting my key at the front desk. Started filling it then. And then when I got to that room and I opened the door to that motel room and I walked in, it brought it all back for me. First time in my motel, in a motel for me since I was shooting heroin. So as soon as I walked in the room, it reminded me of closing the curtains, pulling out the spoon, putting the dope on the spoon, putting water on it, cooking it, pulling it up and slamming it. And, um, I had to walk through that, you know, I had to walk through that, you know, my, um, my supervisor that I work with, we both studied and took the test together. So she had her own room though. And so after we checked in and stuff, when we went out and had dinner, I told her, you know, I told her what was going on for me and that it was really, really strong. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was in danger of going and looking for drugs and getting drugs and doing that, but it was just really that strong pull that it had on me guys. Um, so these are real, these physical and emotional triggers are real. So now what do we do with them? Okay, let me go over some coping strategies. So what we do, I do an exercise in, in, in one of the relapse prevention groups that I do where I work, where one, I give these, these index cards where on one side I have people write their um, triggers. Then on the other side, I have them write their coping strategies. And then after they do that, I have them do it in color. Then I take those little index cards and I take them home, all 25 of them, how many people are in my group, right? And I laminate them. I laminate them, I trim them, I make them look nice and pretty. That's why I tell the clients when they're doing it. I, just, I, I give them colored pencils, colored pens, tell them to make them look pretty. You know, put this in, you know, put some thought into this because this could be a really, really good tool um, for you. It's something I used early on in recovery. Use pictures of my little girl. My little girl was born in two, my not so little girl now, was born in 2001. She's 18. She just graduated. Last year I shared, I think I shared that with you. Um, and, you know, keep these with you, keep them in your pocket. You know, it's funny. I'll run into somebody um, a year ago that was in treatment a year and a half ago. And they say, Greg, I saw that little card, you know, and it touches my heart, you know? So anyways, um, coping strategies. Okay. Call a friend or call a sponsor. If you feel like using call a friend or call a sponsor. Um, you're going to hear sponsor and you're going to hear 12 steps, 12 step go to a meeting. You're going to hear this throughout these coping strategies. It's a common theme. 
And then I'm going to break it down a little bit and tell you why it's a common theme. Okay. Um, go to a meeting is another one. Go to an AA or an A meeting. You're feeling triggered that day. Go to a meeting. Talk about it. Raise your hand. Talk about it. Um, having a hard day. Feeling triggered. You know, take a walk. Take a hike. You know, take a hike. We have really, really beautiful trails here up here in Northern California. Take a hike. Take a dog for a walk. Take the cat for a walk. Try that one, right? Take the cat for the walk. Um, I have to chase our cat. We had a cat that was a wild cat that my sister brought back from um, way up north of California, who was really, really a wild cat. Um, anyways, take a walk, you know, walk the dog, you know, get out, breathe in some fresh air. Very good. Um, go to the gym. Um, exercise. First of all, exercise is just, um, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic um it's a fantastic thing if you can gravitate towards it in recovery because it's such a stress reducer. It's such a, I, 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 I do my best thinking. I do my best thinking on either a run or on the treadmill or the elliptical at the gym. It's just as a way for me to clear my head, for me to think, try to work things out in my mind, any things, any decisions I have to make. Go to the gym. Can't stress after the COVID-19 stuff's over with, by the way. That's the last damn thing I'm going to do in COVID-19 is go to a damn gym. I'm surprised they're even thinking about opening these gyms up um, with this. I don't want to get political now, so I'm going to pass on that. Normal normal circumstances, go to the gym. Can't do it enough. Um, a little story about a, 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 um, um, something that happened to me in early recovery. And this goes back to John Nielsen my spiritual sponsor that I met in Celebrate Recovery. I experienced my very first death of a friend in 2002. And this is a little bit of story too. It's a little celebrity <laughs> involved in the story. My dear friend, Frank Ward, died of a heart attack at 46 years old when I was working at the program that I'm at, currently working at now. And I'm um, out of the blue. And uh, I went to the movies with my mom, my dear mom that day. That was, you know, 2002. We went saw a boxing movie. Yeah, go figure when I just go in the story here. Um, Frank Ward was Andre Ward's father. Andre Ward was the gold medalist in the, in the Athens um, Olympics in 2004 and undefeated um, middleweight, super middleweight and light heavyweight champion of the world. Frank was his dad. And uh, uh, Andre was 18 years old at the time that that happened. And um, Frank's goal for Andre was to always go to the Olympics. He said, son, the trainer wanted Andre to go pro because Andre had an undefeated amateur career, several years in a row, golden gloves um, champion. And so Frank would tell his son, son, I want you to go to the Olympic Games, win a gold medal. You can call your own shot and pave your own path. So anyways, Frank died. Andre's 18 years old. Andre stopped fighting. Andre backed off his faith of God. Andre started drinking. Andre started hanging out with the wrong crowd. So this happens for a few months. Another athlete's name, Napoleon Kaufman, he used to be a running back for the Oakland Raiders. He left pro football to become a pastor. He's a pastor here in the, in the Bay Area. Napoleon Kaufman, Pastor Kaufman, got a hold of Andre, set Andre down and talked to Andre. And he said, son, I'm just worried that if you don't play this out and you don't give it your all to see if you can recognize the dreams that you shared with your father before your father died, I don't know if you'd ever be able to handle that if you don't do it. Storyline is Andre started training again. Andre made the Olympic team and Andre won a gold medal and so on and so forth. Frank's death. I get called that afternoon that Frank died. My friend Frank died 46 years old. Of course, that's a shocking thing at that age. I didn't know what to do, guys. I didn't know. This was the first death I experienced clean and sober. Normal people would want to go probably drink or whatever. I mean, those were off the table for me. I, I, wouldn't even, I didn't even cross my mind. I called my spiritual sponsor, John Nielsen. My friend just died. I need to see you. He had, he had a couple of appointments. Today. I could see you at 3.30, Greg. This is like 1.30, right? So I book down to the gym. I had a membership gym. I go down to the gym. I get on a treadmill and I just start, start, um, start, you know, running. And I had my eyes closed. I was listening to music. Tears were just coming down. And um, a, a gal that I went at the time, 
I feel a tap on my shoulder and there she is looking at me and I just the chair is just going, you know, but you know what guys, I learned how to take care of myself. I learned how to take care of myself then, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was a good thing. Okay. So, um, last one for coping strategies, I think I would like to say is what do you do? Um, what do you do for like weddings, birthday parties, um, different events that happen, um, when you're in, in recovery, right? A lot of drinking is around for a lot of those things and people aren't going to change their lives. A lot of people can handle, you know, having, having drinks on the weekend or there's a lot of normies out there, but we can't do it. You know, going into it, you, you know, take a friend or take your sponsor. Number one, if you feel shaky, you know, bring support with you there. You know, it's, it's actually admirable nowadays to have people um, having somebody that, you know, drinking a Perrier or a bottle of Crystal Kaiser or a diet Coke or whatever to get through that event to be able to make you feel comfortable, makes you feel more comfortable. Um, or, you know, have a plan that you can leave, you know, give yourself permission to leave guys. If you feel a tug and you feel uncomfortable about something, this is your life. You've worked hard on your recovery. You know, you've looked at these things. You looked at relapse prevention. You went through a treatment program or you live, you know, a really strong 12 step program. You, you, you're a sponsee or you're sponsoring people now, or whatever the case may be, you know, it's okay to give yourself permission to leave if you feel uncomfortable. Okay, guys. So um, also, I just want to also share with you the um, share with you um, as far you know, we talked about um, anger and we talked about different feelings and we've talked about stress. You know, these things are, are, are products of life. You know, we live, we all got cell phones. We live in a very fast communication world where people can get a hold of us. We're pulled this way. We're pulled that way. You know, as, as far as exercising and stuff, because there's also Google is your friend. You know, there's there is a couple places that I know of that um, a couple places that I know of that uh, mindful.org. Um, there's a couple different places, you know, Google uh, mindfulness, breathing techniques, different places. They're free guys. Um, go in there and learn, you know, breathing techniques. I went to uh, mindful.org today. And right when you go in there, they have, they have a little button. It's a five minute um, relaxation meditation button. And you, you sit down, get yourself grounded, relax and uh, hit the button. And um, it will walk you through five minutes of, you know, just stress reduction meditation, you know, um, it's really good. Okay. I told you, uh, Wrapping up a little bit, wrapping up the end of the night, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, 12-step meetings and about sponsors and, 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 and what that means and why do I mention it so much. Like I told you, my spiritual sponsor says, Greg, you got to change playgrounds and playmates. You know what, guys and gals, um, that's easier said than done. You know, making a whole new support network. And when you, the, the, the 12 step programs of NA and AA um, are a lifestyle. The steps are, it's a lifestyle program. It's a, it's a, it is a replacement um, of friends and acquaintances or whatever, whatever relationship brings you, you know, you go to a meeting, you know, what I, what I recommend first for anybody that's new in recovery, that's just finishing treatment or, or hasn't been to treatment or wants to stop using and doesn't have to go to treatment to stop using, but can, could, could stop using with, with the fellowship of AA and NA. Um, if I could give you one trait, one quality, if I could give you one tool, one resource for your recovery tool belt, I would give you the gift of AA and NA. Um, why is that? Um, you meet people, you build, you start community building, guys. Um, you get a sponsor. Um, how do you get a sponsor? You go to a meeting, you raise your hand, say, I'm brand new. I'm new at this and I need a sponsor. And somebody will come up to you um, after the meeting and talk to you. Or sometimes they have sponsorship meetings where the, the, the meeting will start out and, and, and the secretary will say, it's a sponsorship meeting. And they'll have um, the, the people that are in recovery raise their hands that are, that are able to sponsor. Men for men, women for women will raise their hands on who they get sponsored. And you can go up and you talk to them afterward. Why is it important? First of all, the first couple of weeks of early recovery, it's a lot of emotions. You know, you need somebody to maybe call and talk to, to help you get through these tough times. You know, a good sponsor will take you and put you under their wing and they will introduce you around to all their friends. 
you know, look for somebody that's got a couple, two, three, four, five years of recovery under the belt. Somebody that's currently working the steps themselves that can explain the steps to you. I'll have another talk here down the road on the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll break them down for you and in, in, in a way, that, you know, that you can relate to or, 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 you know, direct you in a place that you can learn more about those steps. Um, they'll put you under the ring. They'll introduce you, you around to, you know, the people they know. Now you're building a network. What I really recommend is the beauty about NA and AA is um, after a meeting, there's lots of stuff that happens outside of the meeting. There's lots of stuff that happens outside of actually working the 12 steps. Fellowship is wonderful for them where you're making these new connections. You go out for dessert after a, a, um, AA is one hour, NA is an hour and a half. Go to an NA meeting, starts at 7.30, you're done by nine. People go out and have dessert around the corner at the coffee shop afterwards. You sit at a table with these guys. You see this one guy over here. This one guy has been, you know, he's been, you know, he owns his own class company. This guy over here works at Starbucks. This person over here is a lawyer. He, um, addiction does not discriminate guys and gals. It doesn't discriminate. We come from all walks of life. And you sit there and you, you ask the guy, you ask, you ask the guy that works at Starbucks, it's got seven years clean. What was it like your first couple of weeks in recovery? How was it? Did you sleep? How did you sleep? You know, how did you work? What did you do on your step four? Do you remember how to kind of give me some suggestions about doing step four? And so you get to pick these guys' brains and stuff, guys. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Also to mention that they have in, in, in 12 step meetings and stuff, they have uh, clean and sober softball leagues. They have clean and sober dances. They have bowling leagues. They have all kinds of fun stuff, guys. So, anyways, um, I would love um, I would love for you to try going to a twelve step meeting, and, and you know, I, I would love for you to share share it with me um, down the road at another talk that I give. You can write something in the comments. Um, I would really appreciate. It. There's a, there's a comment here in the comments section. I'm going to read it real quick. This is wonderful. I love that. I really, really appreciate that. It's, it's sent by unknown, but I really, really appreciate. I really, really appreciate um, that 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 comment. Um, okay, guys. Um, I guess I will end tonight's um, meeting now. Um, thank you so much. If you stayed and you've listened to this, um, if you listened to my talk um, tonight at all, um, I, I really, really, truly, I, I really hope. Um, that it was helpful for you. Like I said, I will be, um, I will be, I will be here Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific time, guys, every week. Okay. I would love to see you come back and um, take care until next week, guys. God bless.